If you have a Bible, you can maybe turn to Mark's Gospel in chapter 15. Mark in chapter 15. And in the first of these three studies of Mark's account of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're thinking of the three hours of daylight. Twenty second of August, nineteen sixty-six, that there took place in, in London what has become to be known as the Shepherd's Bush murders. There was a, a police man who noticed a blue van uh, passing and uh, parking suspiciously uh, in the center of London and went to check over the van uh, and discovered that the tax disc uh, wasn't in order. But uh, as he went to investigate further, uh, he was attacked by the robbers inside of this van and ensuing battle uh, emerged and, and then uh, officers were, were killed in this encounter. And it has become a, a, a date, a, a time, a, a day which is reflected on uh, by our, our nation because of the, the brutality involved in, in that experience. Every minute has been analyzed. Every action has been scrutinized. Every detail of that day in August 1966 has been poured over by many. And perhaps you have a day in your life exactly like that. Some traumatic experience that you have relived again and again. And every hour has been studied and every movement by every person involved in that day has been poured over. And for every Christian, there is one day which should be examined in great detail by us all because the writers of Scripture linger over it. They take their time. They slow down the, the narrative within the Gospels to allow us to ponder, to see, to sense, to study, to imbibe the greatest day, the day our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was crucified for our redemption. Mark has a penchant for memorable storytelling. He doesn't just seek to, to communicate the, the acts and miracles and words of Jesus, but he seeks to communicate them in a memorable way, in a gripping way, no doubt with a, a view to his hearers having to carry the message of his gospel in their minds. He puts it across in a, in a memorable fashion and his account of the greatest day in history is memorable. And he, he divides this day of 24 hours, obviously from evening to evening, into three hour segments. And in our communion time, we, we pull out nine hours, nine hours around the cross of Calvary, and, and we enter into the details which Mark sets out for us. We had it in our reading, didn't we? In verse number 22, uh, so, sorry, later on, 25, it was the third hour when they crucified him, 12, it's, uh, 9 o'clock in the morning. And then in verse 33, when the sixth hour, 12 o'clock, had come, there was darkness over the whole land. We study the, the first three hours then. From nine o'clock to twelve in our time, in Mark's time here, from the, the third hour to the sixth hour. And there's, there's three main 
emphasis that we, we find in his account here in this, this first this segment, the hours of daylight at the cross of Jesus. The first is in verse 23 that the wine been offered and rejected. They brought, they offered him, verse 23, wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Maybe you were wondering why we read from Proverbs 31. Uh, did I have a hidden agenda in reading from that chapter? But it's because the action here is rooted in Proverbs 31, uh, verses 6 and 7, which we read. Alcohol is for the dying, and wine for those in bitter distress. The they in verse 23 are probably women of Jerusalem. They, they had this role of offering this wine mingled with myrrh. It was an opiate. A kind of anesthetic that would dull the pain of the, the, the victim to be crucified or even put them to sleep. Crucifixion, as you know, was, was the cruelest of deaths. One writer says that the, the victim died a thousand deaths. Suspended by the nails through hands and feet, the little seat on the cross didn't really pry provide much relief but prolonged the agony of the victim at the cross. Struggling to breathe, the baking sun beating down on them, creating an incredible thirst, the, the headache which emerged. And out of compassion, out of mercy, the, the, the woman of Jerusalem, they would meet the victim on the, the Via Dolorosa, the, the cobbled stones which led outside of Jerusalem to the place of execution, and they would offer this, this opiate. And, and it says that Jesus did not take it. He wanted to be in full control of all that he did. He wanted his mental powers to be submissive to the will of God. He wanted his mind to be able to hold on to the promises from heaven. He wanted willingly, voluntarily, to give his life for us. We go to the dentist. We go to the hospital and we get the anesthetic and the dentist and the surgeon can be doing all kinds of things to us and we have absolutely no idea what's going on. But Jesus decided, chose to be in full control of everything that he did. He says in John 10, no one takes my life from me. I have power to lay it down. Sometimes we hear of the most awful experiences of others, the pain they've passed through, the displacement that they've undergone, the struggles that they've had. And we enter with sympathy into their experience and their trial, but we hope we will never have to pass through that ourselves. But here's our Savior familiar with crucifixion. He had passed other victims outside of Jerusalem, crucified by the Romans. He had heard their screams. He had witnessed their agonies. He knew from prophecy and experience what this involved. But out of love for us, he chose to be in full control of his mental and physical powers and willingly give himself for us. The wages of our sin is death and Jesus died. 
we won't get to the throne of God and be sentenced to a hundred days in purgatory to top up the suffering of Jesus because he'd taken the anesthetic and didn't experience death in its fullness and power. But voluntarily and consciously he gives his life for us. Some university lectures are long, tedious, and boring. The student is present in body and mark present, but very absent in mind. Sleep or tweeting is the only way to get through that long, tedious, and boring lecture. Jesus is present in death and active in death gives himself for us. As we think of this today, we respond with gratitude and love and praise. I remember getting a parking ticket and I used it. I was in a Christian bookshop and I got a parking ticket and I used that experience in a children's dress in the church. And someone paid the parking ticket for me. And I've never forgotten their kindness. Another time I was in Lidl's store. And for some reason, I was five pounds short in my money. And the lady behind me paid the shortfall. And I've never forgotten her kindness. Here we are today, right to the very heart of the Bible, the heart of history, the Son of God, consciously, voluntarily, giving himself to the full, blown experience of death. We respond with gratitude, and love, and thanksgiving. Moving on to the, the second emphasis in Mark's account here, it's voluntary. Second details that he gives us in verse 24 to 27, the garments of Jesus and the robbers who are crucified beside him and the title, the King of the Jews. The garments. In verse number 24, they divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. The Roman execution squad consisted of four soldiers and the items of Jesus' clothing were five items. Four of those items were of equal value. The fifth, the inner tunic, was more valuable. So they divide the four equal valued garments among them, the sandals, the belt, the outer garment, and the headgear. But then for the fifth item, the gamble, they throw lots, what it should take. But the point being made here, the theological point that being made here is that Jesus had nothing. Everything that he had was there on him. And at this moment of crucifixion, he had nothing. Roman and Jewish law insisted and commanded that the crucified would be crucified outside of the city. And they would be crucified at the roadside so that people would pass by and see them. That their feet would come to the average head height, and there was Jesus, without garments, crucified before the public, the humiliation, the shame, the connection to Adam in the garden. Adam, before his fall, had no garments, but was not ashamed. Adam and Eve, after the fall, were full of shame. And here's the Savior 
the sin bearer, stepping in to the very place of humanity's fall, taking us right back to Eden. That moment when humanity sinned. He's dressing like the first sinner as he's come to save sinners. He's standing in our place. He's taking our burden of guilt. The title, The Robbers, also emphasized this vicarious position which Jesus is adopting. The title, The King of the Jews, and being crucified beside two robbers. The, the Greek word means insurrectionists, zealots, those who opposed the Roman occupation. They would steal from Roman soldiers. They would take away Roman soldiers' lives. Jesus, claiming to be the king of the Jews, is considered by Pilate, by the leaders of the nation, as an insurrectionist, a rival king. He's been considered and charged geographically and where he's crucified between two robbers and also legally sentenced by Pilate to be a transgressor, to be a sinner. George Smeaton, in his wonderful book on the atonement in the Gospels, draws this, this wonderful insight between the court of heaven and the court of earth. Here is Pilate who recognizes that there's no sin in Jesus. Three times over he says, I do not find fault in him, yet he sentences him, him to death. God in heaven sees the sinlessness of his son, yet judges him as the one bearing our sins. The garments, the robbers, the title emphasize that Jesus is not only dying voluntarily, but Jesus is dying vicariously. He's in our place, our room, our stead. And we respond with faith and trust and dependence on the Son of God. Perhaps you say today, well, I don't feel forgiven. Do you feel you're a man today? Do you feel you're a woman today? Do you feel you're a son today? It's more objective than how we feel, isn't it? It's outside of us. It's, it's what's written. It's what's said. It's what's stated. And we have to take that objective truth and reality and, and apply it to our hearts and lives. And hear Mark and his account of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is making these theological connections and links. Here is Christ dying in our place, the second Adam, the substitute of sinners. Then the third detail in this section of the hours of daylight is the mockers in verses 29 to 32. And again, Mark sets this out really clearly for us, doesn't he? There are three different types of mockers. Verse 29, those who pass by deriding him up and down that road into Jerusalem. Then there's, at the end of verse 32, those who were crucified with him, they also reviled him, the thieves on either side of him. But he focuses on the religious leaders in verses 30 and 31. Their chief priests and the scribes mocked him and they said he saved others he cannot save himself they were saying this in a mocking fashion weren't they? they they were seeking to cast aspersions on his claims to being the son of God and sent by heaven they're acknowledging yes he performed miracles in his lifetime he saved others but look at him now look at his weakness 
Look at his humiliation. Look at his shame. He cannot stand up to the might of the Roman powers. He saved others. But look at him now. He cannot save himself. And Mark wants those words to linger and fester in our minds. He cannot save himself because he's come to save us. And to save us, he must lay down his life for us. He must take that cup of judgment which is in God's hand and he must drink it in our place. He must take on his broad, sinless shoulders, our iniquities, sins, transgressions on himself. He must enter down into the darkness of death and forsakenness. He cannot save himself because he is saving us. A few years ago, a famous knee surgeon and his two friends dived into the water to save four surfers who were in trouble. And the knee surgeon and his two friends drowned in their attempt to save the others. They didn't have to die. Another day they might not have died. But for Christ it was different. To be our saviour, he could not save himself and we come with humility in response to that and recognize the pain that our wrongdoing has cost our savior and we promise that by his grace we will follow him dying voluntarily dying for us vicariously dying for us necessarily he cannot save himself we have a call here to peace in in our suffering don't we all of these sufferings set out for us here in the three hours of daylight were prophesied in the old testament in the psalms in the prophets There's nothing new here. Nothing that Jesus did not know. No surprises come on him. It's all foreplanned. It's all controlled. It's all ordered by heaven. And so too are our sufferings. Deep. Though they sometimes are. Excruciating. Though they might be. God in heaven is in control of all. A call to meditation here. Mark slowing it down. Letting us linger and study and scrutinize these three hours of crucifixion. Setting out that title in red or black letters above the head of Jesus. The mockery. The garments wants us to slow down and linger and think. We struggle to do this. We like noise. We like the radio on or the the TV visual. We like conversation and we're sociable people and yet there's times in our experience to, to meditate, to be alone with our thoughts, to think of Christ's love and grace. The Armistice Museum, 37 miles outside of Paris, focuses on the last seven days of World War I. The discussions, the agreements, the movement of troops, the collapse of the enemy. Such crucial moments out of all the days in World War I, the last seven are studied. And you and I as Christians are to linger over these moments of sacrifice and love for us. And lastly, this 
section calls us to take up our cross. Jesus took up his cross for us. And we are to take up our cross in following him. There is a cost in living out the Christian life. A cost in every area of our experience. We too will experience mockery and and ridicule as our Lord and Savior did. We too as church leaders will be misunderstood and misinterpreted. We too as Christians within our workplace, family and community will be maligned for our dedication and commitment. We too will take decisions which cost us emotionally financially, physically, as we take up our cross and follow our Savior. The three hours of daylight.